So it's a great pleasure for me to uh, continue Pavel's lectures on the tangent point energy. And let me just uh, tell you what's going to be the program today. I'm going to talk about the right energy spaces. And with right, I mean, roughly speaking, a function space on which the energy behaves nicely. And then uh, I will use that as a basis to uh, tell you something about finding critical points using symmetry tomorrow. Or not tomorrow, on Friday. The first lecture on Friday will be my last lecture. So, and uh, I used the time in between talks to uh, repeat this drawing that Pavel had to uh, write down the energy again, but in another form. Um, so this is the curve in green, and we have two curve points, gamma of u and gamma of u plus some shift w. And uh, we know that the energy is some double integral over the inverse tangent point radius uh, to the power q. And for always, I assume q between 2 and infinity. So this is a general assumption here. And now to um, allow for curves that are not parameterized by arc length, uh, let me just add some tangent or some velocity factors here to make this integral parameter independent. And the domain of integration now is uh, r over lz. So these are periodic functions with period L, capital L. Mostly L is 1 in my case. And the inner integral is um, with respect to w, which is the shift from minus L half to plus L half. And remember now what was inside here. In the denominator, it was basically the distance between those two curve points. So gamma of u plus w minus gamma of u to the power 2. And then uh, up to a factor of 2 in the numerator, we had the distance uh, from that point to the tangent line uh, of the curve at the point gamma of u. So this is this white line. I wrote down gamma of u plus all multiples of the tangent. And this distance was in the numerator to uh, uh, power 1. And um, I want to express this now as the length of the projection of this blue vector between the curve points onto the normal space of the curve at this point. So instead of writing distance, I write now the length of the projection onto the normal space at gamma of u. So p perp is always the projection onto normal spaces. And what I project is that blue vector, which is, again, the distance vector between those two curve points. So this is another form of writing down the tangent point energy. And you can write this down for, say, all Lipschitz curves, because these, these derivatives are defined almost everywhere, and everything is fine. This is more appropriate, because now we are doing analysis with this, uh, with this uh, integrand. And the central, central theorem of today's talk is due to Simon Blatt, and it's a good occasion to mention the contributions of the organizers in this talk. So theorem, and I guess the last theorem that Pavel had was number two, so let me say this is theorem three now. And uh, this is proven by Simon sometime before 2011. And I will make two statements. And this theorem will show what are the right energy spaces. So let me write it down first. Whenever I write capital gamma, as Pavel did, this is an arc length parameterized curve. And I assume that this curve is already C1, say, on R with period 1, values in R3. So arc length parameterization, let me just repeat, this means unit velocity. And I assume that restricted to one period, this is an injective curve. And I assume that this energy is finite. So EQ of gamma is finite. Then the statement is that this curve is actually better than C1 alpha. So Pavel proved that this curve should be C1 alpha for some alpha. And uh, now we have that this curve is actually in a better space. And let me write down the space first, and then I will comment on this. So it's a space called uh, w to some uh, constants here. There's a constant q here. And um, it comes with an estimate. There are constants c depending on q and beta depending on q, both positive, such that a semi-norm, which, uh, which comes with the definition of this weird space of the tangent, is actually bounded, say, to the power q, is bounded 
by this constant times the energy and again the energy but to a different power. So this looks very technical and I will explain the details. For the moment you should think of this space as being something between C1 and C2. So it's not C2, definitely not, but it's better than C1, it's something in between. So some fractional order of differentiability. I will give the precise definition in a moment. The second part is formulated in this way. If you take um, a curve, gamma, not necessarily arc length parametrized, in that weird space, these are so-called sobolev slobodetsky spaces, so it's the same space, and let's say this R has period 1, and if this R is regular, meaning that the velocity is positive, and uh, if it's injective restricted to 0, 1, then one can prove that the energy is finite. So it's in both ways, basically. Only that for the first part I need to have a good parameterization already. So this is a theorem that tells you what is the right space where the energy is finite on and vice versa. So why should we know about this? What is a set of motivations? So motivations, let me write down may, maybe one, four or five things. So first of all, I said in the beginning the energy behaves nicely. So Pavel told you yesterday how to prove lower semi-continuity in the C1 topology. And th that's not a very strong, uh, strong property. It's uh, sufficient to prove existence of minimizers. But if you want continuity, you need more. So there's a direct proof possible uh, in this space that the energy is continuous. But Simon Blatt and Philip Reiter went further and proved differentiability. So now I can mention um, the second of our organizers. And I think this paper came out in 2012 or so, I'm not sure. They proved this energy is C1. Uh, actually, they proved differentiability, but with methods developed somewhere else for other energies that can prove C1. So Frechet differentiability and continuity of the, of the uh, differential. So this is very nice because now we can think of critical points, classical critical points. So critical points can be investigated because they are the zeros of the differential. And uh, you can do this in several ways. So first you can find them. So this is existence of critical points. And I'm going to say something using symmetry in my second lecture. So it's a lecture on Friday. But you could also think of, say, mountain pass theory, which is not done. So there's a lot of open questions in that. You can also think about trying to prove higher regularity. So uh, let me write smoothness for critical points, because they are distinguished curves, um, distinguished from any other curve that has just finite energy. So this is, for this energy, open. But for other energies, our three organizers and various corporations could prove smoothness of critical points. In particular also for the well-known Möbius energy, which was the hardest case. And also there they needed to know which is the right energy space, for instance for the Möbius energy. So now you can mention Blatt, Reiter and Shikora. So there's a deep paper on criticality uh, of the Möbius energy, smoothness of critical points. I'm not sure, it came maybe out in 2014. Please, 15, please correct me, uh, 15, a deep paper. Uh, but for this energy, smoothness is open, and uh, the experts do not expect uh, C-infinity smoothness because this is some degenerate equation that is underlying there. So lots of open questions here, too. And you can think of a gradient flow. Let me just abbreviate this. An analytic formulation of a gradient flow, which is completely open for this energy, but for other energies, uh, Simon Blatt has proved uh, existence and other things. So all of this can be done once you know the right energy spaces. And uh, thirdly, I would like to mention since Søren Bartels is here, I think I've seen him, and uh, he has a cooperation with I think Johannes Rieger and um, Philipp Reiter on discretization. So they discretized this energy, this tangent point energy, and did estimates. So serious numerical analysis numerical analysis, also using information that they have because in the continuous case they know the exact spaces. So this is 
Bartels, and then we have Riga. I'm not sure if you can see this down here, uh, and you have Philip Reiter again. This is 2016, and uh, maybe um, mentioning another thing, uh, you can do you can analyze the second variation, so second derivatives, which is done for other energies as well, and since. Uh, Ishiseki and Nagasawa are here, they did this for the Möbius energy. And also there, it's very useful to know these right energy spaces. So let me just write here higher variations, many open problems, not done for the tangent point energy. Higher variations. For all of that, it's very good to know the exact spaces. So now I have to come back and tell you what are those spaces here, these weird spaces. And for that, I make the following definition. Um, let's fix some parameters. So L is always the length of the interval. And then we have some parameter between 0 and 1. This is the parameter measuring the, the degree of differentiability. And then there is some integrability coefficient in general between 1 and infinity. And then you can uh, define a seminorm for a function going from R over LZ. I only define this for the periodic functions on the real line. So you can define this in more general ways, but that's enough for our case. And let's just take values in R3. And for this I define for this I define the seminorm square bracket of F with uh, indices uh, S rho um, and this is an integral double integral to some power 1 of rho and um, this is exactly the semi-norm that I stated here for the tangent and now I state this for general f for general parameters and now here in the numerator you have f of u plus w minus f to the power rho and the numer in the denominator you have this increment uh, w to the power 1 plus s times rho because we are working on the real line, there's a 1 here and then you integrate from minus uh, l half to plus l half over r over l z. So you can calculate that this is uh, has a seminorm properties and now the space w uh, 1 plus s comma rho on R over LZ, values in R3, is all functions that are in the standard Sobolev space um, such that the additional information is true that F prime, so the seminorm of the first derivative with these indices, is finite. So this looks weird. Uh, people who are not familiar with Sobolev uh, spaces just think for a moment about C1 functions, which uh, have the additional information that this seminorm is actually finite. And if you look at the seminorm, you see some sort of difference quotient here. There are some parameters, but it looks like a difference quotient. And I'm not demanding that these difference quotients converge as w tends to zero, but having this integral finite gives you some control over these difference quotients. And this gives you some information about a uh, kind of derivative of fractional order. This is the feeling that you should have. And we will get back to this double integral formulation because I really want to tell you how to play around with this double integral and how to relate this double integral with that double integral. Okay? This is the purpose of today's talk. So you should feel a little more familiar after this lecture with this double integral. Okay, this Sobolev space. If you uh, wonder why in many analysis talks you see these Sobolev spaces, just recall from history that up to the end of the 19th century, people assumed existence for all types of objects, especially existence of minimizers for energies, and then they calculated with these supposedly existing minimizers, and then there was criticism coming up, and finally, Weierstrass actually gave some simple energies as examples that you cannot minimize in classical function spaces. That you cannot minimize, for instance, in C1, although they were pretty simple looking, nice looking energies, but still you could prove, assume that there's a minimizer in C1, then you arrive at a contradiction. 
So this really opened the eyes and then people went back to older papers and tried to prove existence wherever it was needed. So to have larger spaces is good to prove existence because the Sobolev spaces, as an example, have nice compactness properties. And then after you find some guy in here minimizing energy, you can try to prove that this minimizer is actually better in some classical space. That's very often the case. And this is the program, and this is the reason why these spaces appear very often. For my talks, you don't need to know anything about those guys. Just think of C1. But you uh, have this additional requirement to arrive uh, in these so-called sobolev slobodetsky spaces. So that's a finer scale of spaces between differentiability between 1 and 2, say. And um, you need to know only two facts about these spaces for my talks. Um, so the first fact is that these are Banach spaces. And for these basic facts, I would recommend to read as a first reading the so-called Hitchhiker's Guide to Fractional Sobolev Spaces. This is on the net. It's uh, written by, I think, three Italians. Valdinocci is one of the authors. And um, there is some easygoing introduction into these kind of spaces. And this fact is proven there. And uh, the other fact that I want to use, or at least cite, is that these spaces are good because every function in here can be interpreted as a C1 alpha function already. So it's better than C1 alpha for a certain alpha. Let me say the following statement. So if rho is greater than 1 and s is in between 1 over rho and 1, so that's a slight, slight restriction compared to that restriction here, um, then there exists then there exists some uniform constant, I call it CE, E stands for embedding, which doesn't depend on any function, such that for all functions we have the estimates F um, with respect to the C1 alpha norm, and the alpha you take is S minus 1 over rho. This is bounded from above by this universal constant times F in that fractional Sobolev norm. So 1 plus S comma rho. So we can think of these functions as at least this good. So we have classic differentials and these are Hölder continuous. And this holds for all f for all f in that space. So these constants here, this constant does not depend on the individual f. Uh, for the experts, strictly speaking, you know that elements in here are only equivalence classes of functions. And representatives differ only by a set of on a set of measure zero. But I don't want to go into details, so this would be a nice representative. Let's just think of all functions in here are C1 alpha. And this constants here, let's take it for our case. Here, you can do a little algebra with these uh, parameters compared to these spaces. Here you have this embedding, um, say, f in C1, comma 1 minus 2 over Q is less or equal than this universal constant times f in that space of the theorem of Simon Blatt. Okay, and this parameter actually is the optimal parameter that Pavel mentioned yesterday. He said, I think he didn't do the details in his first lectures, um, you can iterate the non-optimal regularity with some tricks using more parts of the curve in the energy to get up to this optimal parameter. And this uh, result of Simon Blatt says, well, our curves are actually in this space and this embedding has the optimal constants here. So there are no better curves in there in general. So you, you have curves in here that are this good but not any better. Okay, so this, these are the two facts I want like, would like to use today and uh, also cite in the fourth lectures. And nothing more you have to know, but now you follow me, I hope I invite you to follow me going through the arguments to get more acquainted with this type of semi-norm. So I'm going to try to give you ideas of the proof of these two things. So for the proof, part one. 
Uh, let me start using that assumption that the curve is in C1. So I want to localize my consideration and using that the tangent is continuous I can find some constant depending on this individual curve such that the oscillation of the tangent is small. So let me write down gamma prime at the shifted point minus gamma prime at the original point is less or equal than square root over 2. So it's just some small number. And this holds for all u and um, for all increments w less or equal than this delta gamma. And let me call this 1 because I'm going to cite that in the moment. And I'm also going to come back to that thing here for a remark later on in the proof. So now I do a preliminary calculation. And remember now that we have in the numerator of that energy some projection onto normal spaces. So let me try to estimate if you have two of those projections, one to the normal plane at gamma of u plus w of this difference of curve points. And then another one, like in the energy, onto the normal space at gamma of u of the same difference. And I want to estimate the square of the distance of these two projections. And for brevity, because these differences appear very often, I will always write some delta gamma for a difference of two curve points. And if I want to be precise, I write down here the increment at the bottom and the point u here but mostly I will just write delta gamma. Same here. So if I carry out this square, I can do this. I have to, oh, let me first say, let me write out these projections. So projections onto the normal space is the same as identity minus projection onto the tangent space. And writing this out, I get this difference vector minus the projection onto the tangent space. Now this is the scalar product of this uh, difference vector with the tangent which is a unit tangent. So this is the first orthonormal projection onto the normal space, written like this. And then I subtract the same term, only that now I project onto another space, namely on the space at u, at gamma of u. So the square of that is that. And now you see that this here cancels, fine. And I carry out the square by just taking the scalar product with itself. And now you get the first term squared. But uh, this squared is just one because of arc length parameterization. You get the second term squared, which is this term here, squared. And you get a mixed term. And the mixed term is two times the first number times the second number, times the product of these two tangent vectors. So that's another scalar product. OK, so this is an identity, very elementary identity. And now I would like to discover this sum of squares as the resulting from another square. So let me write down this other square. I could just subtract these two numbers from each other and square that. And then you see you have that squared is this, this squared is this, but there's another mixed term which is not there. So let me correct this by writing down this other mixed term, which is thus two times the product of the two numbers. And then you discover this correction term is already contained in this line because it's this number here. So I can write this as 1 for the correction minus times this product of tangent vectors. Well, easy enough. Nothing happened, still equality. Of course, we observe that this is greater or equal than 0 as a square. And we're going to leave that away to have an estimate from below. And this, and this is a trick that will repeatedly appear today, this can be read as um, one half of gamma prime at this position minus gamma prime at the other position squared. 
You can see that because if you square that, you get one here, one here, cancelled by one half. This gives this one, and there's a mixed term. Okay? Using arc length parameterization. Now you have smuggled in a distance that appears in the semi norm. In the semi norm, in the numerator, you have such a distance. And this is already a hint that this could be a good estimate. Because we are going to estimate the energy from below by some terms um, involving the semi norm of the derivative. So to make that short, I can rewrite this again as difference now of tangent vectors. Okay? And here you have terms difference of points. And there's another difference of points. And you can write this using the fundamental theorem of calculus by integral over the derivative. So you can write this as w, the increment times the integral from 0 to 1, of gamma prime of u plus sigma w d sigma. And you can do the similar, th similar thing for that second term. So you have two integrals sitting in here with uh, new gamma prime terms. And if I now do the estimate, then I can estimate this from below. So it's greater or equal than, leaving out this square term, which is useless, cancellation of this two with this two, and I end up now, let me, let me say something before I do this. So, I'll, I will write it down anyway. So, we have cancellation of the two. We have a W coming from this term, another W coming from this term. So, this would give me a W squared times, and now we have the integral of scalar product of U plus sigma W times scalar product U plus W d sigma. And there's another such integral gamma prime of u plus, say, tau times w gamma prime of u d tau. So this takes care of these integrals. And then we have this number here, which is nothing else than the difference on tangent vectors squared. I hope I didn't forget anything. Okay, so now we want to observe that here again, you have mixed terms of a quadr quadratic thing. So we can write this, again, same trick as before, as... So what do I have to write? I have to write 1 minus 1 half of gamma prime of u plus, say, tau w minus gamma prime of u squared. Same trick. And now I use assumption 1. The assumption 1 was that this oscillation is small. If I calculate on this local scale, which means this is the assumption for my calculation, and I use uh, that one to say, well, what I subtract there is less or equal than, if I take the square, one-half. So one-half times one-half is one-quarter. So this whole thing is greater or equal than three-quarters. And the same happens here. So you get, by assumption one, this is greater or equal than three-quarters square times w square times what remains. It's the distance of tangent vectors square. And this holds only for small increments, w, satisfying this. But we keep this in mind as a preliminary, preliminary calculation. And now want to use that to get the main estimate for part one of the theorem, which is uh, actually shorter than this. So I start with the energy. I start with the energy of gamma, which was up to a factor of this term there. And you see now that you have only one of these projections. And in this preliminary calculation, I have two of them. But you can use a simple trick. So you can uh, divide this energy uh, in one half of the energy plus one half of the energy. And the second half, I just copy. It's like this, it's to the power q, and here in the numerator, in the denominator, we have this difference to the power 2q, which is fine. And um, here, you do a, a little trick. With Fubini, you take out the inner integral to the outer, then you do a small substitution, and then you use periodicity to write down the same integral, but at a shifted place. So you can write down the same integral as projection onto this different normal space of the same difference. So maybe that's a good thing to carry out as an exercise to find the right substitution. It's not difficult at all. But now you have two terms here. At least you have two 
different projections onto normal spaces. And now I use the basic inequality that you all know, a minus b to the power q is less or equal than 2 to the q minus 1 times a to the q plus b to the q. Using that inequality, I can see that this term here appears here. This is 1a to the power q plus b to the power q. So uh, if I ignore some factors, I can bound this from below. Ignoring factors means always that I write a trigger here by the difference of projections. So projections onto that point or normal place at that point minus projection onto the different point and this is to the power q and now in the numerator in the denominator you have uh, this guy to the power 2q. So this is actually this integration and here we have minus one half plus one half. So now I want, would like to use this estimate here, but this was only valid for small deviations w, so let me just replace this and make it even smaller by minus delta gamma and plus delta gamma in order to use this estimate for the numerator. Um, I can do this, okay, then uh, I use this estimate 2 for the numerator and observe that the denominator is bounded from above by just w to the power 2q because we have a Lipschitz continuous curve with Lipschitz constant 1. It's arc length parameterization. So now I end up with something and here we have delta gamma until delta gamma and then we have this w squared. Well this was a square difference so if that is to the power q we get a power w to the power q. This number is ignored and here this prime difference. So here I get uh, the prime difference to the power q and these w's to the power q they cancel with this one so what is left is just this difference. And if you plug in these numbers in the seminorm, this is exactly the right seminorm term, semi -norm term. So this corresponds to the right seminorm with the right indices here. The only catch here is that you have the wrong integration domain in the inner integral. It's too small. For the seminorm, you need the full integration domain. And uh, well, in order to uh, circumvent that, we summarize this estimate that we have so far. So I write down the full semi-norm, say to the power q, and then I have here 1 minus 1 over q, q. And this semi-norm is something like this, but with a full integration domain, but I can split the integration domain. So part of it is with small integration domain. Use that estimate to find this energy as the upper bound. But what is left here is an integration over Rz and then from minus one half to plus one half and taken out this interval from minus delta gamma to plus delta gamma and then here in the numerator you have that difference of tangents and in the denominator you have w to the power q. This is not a singular integral because you have cut out the singularity so this is finite and we could be satisfied and have at least shown that finite energy implies finite Sobolev semi-norm but there's a little catch. I mean, I, I stated a much stronger estimate because on the right-hand side there's no delta gamma. It's just the energy value. And this can be fixed. In the moment, it's just something that goes like, say, delta gamma to the power 1 minus q. And this, uh, imagine you do this estimate along a sequence of curves. So there's a gamma i here, gamma i here, and then here there is delta gamma i here, and along a sequence these deltas could converge to zero. And this is a negative power, so let me just write informally. This would explode to infinity if delta gamma goes to zero, which is bad. And this can be fixed by proving, and this is not going to be done in this lecture, one can show, and this is a technique that goes back actually to Campanato uh, analyzing and characterizing Hölder spaces, so it's an old technique. And we can use what we have proved so far. We can use this first line to prove the following oscillation estimate. So we can prove that the oscillation of the tangent actually can be controlled in terms of the energy. 
Um, so there's a uniform constant involved here, say C, and this energy to the power 1 over Q times the increment to some alpha, and this alpha is exactly the optimal Hilda exponent that you have seen before. So once you have proven that, I will indicate in a moment how to prove this, but once you have proven that, you can go back to this assumption 1 and say a little more about this. So it's easy to find a delta gamma small enough. No problem, because you have continuous derivatives. But then you can slightly increase gamma until you actually find a pair of parameters, say u0, w0, where this is attained as an equality. Okay? Let's assume we have done that. We can use then this estimate to get a lower bound on delta gamma. So then we find, we go back to this particular pair of points, gamma prime of u0 plus w0 minus gamma prime of u0, use this estimate for, once we have proven that, we get something apart from constants, depending just on the energy value, and then you get this term. But this is too, f too fast, because this thing here can be only proven for w less than gamma half. Well, that's a little catch here. So don't use that that early, which I wanted to do, but just use triang in, 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 triangle inequality to plug in an intermediate point so that you have a small increment. So say w uh, not half, and then you have the same term with triangle inequality. And now you see that these increments are actually small enough to use this estimate for for both of these terms. So both of these terms are now estimated from above by some constant uh, times the energy to the power 1 over q times this increment uh, w not half which is less than delta gamma half and uh, let me just write down delta gamma half to that weird power 1 minus 2 over q. And now you see that delta gamma half is bounded from below by some numerical constant and this energy value taken on the other side. So in this way, you can remove this problem here, but in order to do that, you have to show 4, and I'm not going to do it here. In order to show 4, maybe for the analysts, one, uh, one knows that gamma prime has, uh, at almost every point, gamma prime has Lebesgue points. So Lebesgue points are points where you can approximate the vector nicely by integral means. And then, on a small scale, you can compare two different of such uh, integral mean value integrals, and um, writing it all out, you end up with a double integral, which can be estimated from above by exactly that integral. No? This is some calculation. And this integral is, as we know, bounded by this term. So, putting it all together using some telescoping sums and so on, you can arrive at this estimate. So there's some technical computation involved, which I'm not going to show. But part one is proven apart from this technical thing. And I would also like to comment on part two, which takes on the other way, because you see also a nice interplay of this double integral with by Lipschitz estimates, with local by Lipschitz estimates. And you have seen in Pavel's talks already some hints uh, towards that, and I could also use that using C1 alpha regularity, but I'm using this double integral. So, for part two, let's start with a by Lipschitz uh, observation. It's more like an observation using this double integral. So writing the distance of two curve points. So now I should say, first of all, without loss of generality, we can assume that this given curve gamma is actually arc length parametrized. Why is that? Because I want to prove that the energy is finite and this energy does not depend on the parametrization. And the second item for that is, if gamma is in that class and regular, like this, then you can prove by direct calculation that also the arc length parametrization has finite semi-norm and it can be estimated in terms of the original semi-norm. So there are two things to be checked for that, but if I know these, I can just write down the difference of curve points again of this parametrization. Let's uh, square that. And this is nothing else than the scalar product with itself. And now I use what I did before, I write those things as integrals over derivatives. Again, the fundamental theorem. So if I do this, say from, z from u to u plus w, uh, and again, u from u plus w, 
I get this scalar product of derivatives at, say, sigma and derivative at tau integrated with respect to tau and sigma. And what do we do again? We see this as a mixed term. So this is like 1 minus 1 half of gamma prime of sigma minus gamma prime of tau squared. Same thing as before. So integrating over the 1 gives you a w squared. So you get a w squared here. And then you have minus 1 half of this double integral over a term that is almost the semi-norm. So let me write it as if it was a nu um, numerator already. d sigma d tau, or d tau d sigma, whatever. And um, if I want to make this double integral to be the semi-norm, you know, there needs to be some denominator, because the semi-norm needs this denominator. And let me just put it in here for the moment and remark that sigma minus tau is always smaller than w. So even if I put a w squared in front, it's an estimate because w squared is bigger than this guy. So let's put an inequality sign here. But now you have a term that is a semi-norm term. And if I do the Hilda inequality, I can estimate from below by, say, w squared taken out before, and then yeah, I have 1 minus, and then I get, well, never heard that in public, but uh, w squared from the integration domain uh, times 1 minus 2 over q, and then we have here, say, the full semi-norm of the tangent with power q, and here's a power 2, I guess, and that's that should be it. So maybe there is some one half missing, whatever. So, but you see now, this thing is assumed to be finite. This means that you can squeeze this w so small that this bracket is greater or equal than, say, three quarters again. So this is greater or equal, or let's say, put it as a square, so greater or equal than 9 sixteenths w square. For all w square, less or equal than some constant, depending only on gamma, to be more precise, depending only on the semi-norm of this gamma prime. So this is a positive number, depending on on just the data, and this is a localized by Lipschitz estimate, and then I do the same as Pavel did yesterday, I look at the rest. So the rest is a function of u and w. It's uh, this function here, and let's not square it in the moment. Uh, this is positive and uniformly continuous on the compact set, sigma which is just the rest. Set of parameters, uw, such that w is greater or equal than this epsilon here. So there's a positive constant. So g of uw is greater or equal than some positive constant, depending, of course, on how well this curve is embedded in space. I couldn't tell a priori. Uh, this is a positive constant, and you can artificially make this to a b Lipschitz constant by writing this for all epsilon less or equal than w less or equal than l halves. I write l here because I don't know on which length the, uh, on, uh, the arc length parameterization is defined. So it's this interval. So you see, now we have a uh, by Lipschitz estimate, depending on gamma, of course, because if you plug this and this together, you have a by Lipschitz estimate. And now it's easy to show part two. It's just a two-liner. If I omit some details, and let me do this maybe on the blackboard behind. May I also use this for this little part here? So now comes the main estimate for part two. Let's 
So now we uh, have finite semi-norm and want to estimate the energy. So the energy, EQ, is um, can be written up to a constant by this integral. Okay, and then we have this projection onto the normal space uh, to the power Q divided by this guy here to the power 2Q. And now I use what I said, the Lipschitz estimate, to say that this denominator is bounded from below uh, up to a constant, depending on gamma, up to a constant by the same W to the power 2Q. And I'm using this calculation that I have up on the right, on the top board. And uh, the numerator, we have again this difference here. So let me write this difference again as derivative over the over the um, derivative integral over the derivative. So like this. And I did this before. Okay. So uh, doing this, I can estimate this from above by taking these w's that appear here to the power q and these w's together. So I have w integral over w to the power q which is already the right power for the semi-norm. And here I write pu perp of this integral from 0 to 1 and then I have gamma prime of u plus sigma w and I close this integration just there to fill in something that is not there. So I fill in something that is not seen by the projection. It's the projection onto the normal space. So I can plug in this tangential vector artificially. But now I have artificially introduced a difference again. And now it's a matter of Fubini taking out this integral to the outside. Then this projection is estimated as an operator by norm 1. Take that out. Take uh, Then you have power Q, which I forgot here, so it must be some power Q here. Then you end up with something where in the interior you have, after substitution, the semi-norm already of this gamma prime which is by assumption bounded. And here you can have some outer integration, some positive powers of sigma which don't, don't matter. So this is the other way around. So this is the easier direction. Okay, so this is uh, enough indication of the proof of this uh, fundamental theorem that is so important for all the upcoming developments so that I would like to uh, make a few final comments preparing for lecture four. I still have a few minutes for that. So the first comment is um, the length. Uh, yesterday uh, it was stressed that the length for minimization problems needs to be somehow fixed. So we are going to consider in lecture four scaled energy to have to avoid this length problem. So I call it SQ for scaled, which is just the same as the tangent point energy but with length factor that scales in the right way. So this function is scale invariant. And the benefit of that is that uh, whenever you have some minimal sequence you can scale back to length 1, which is the nicest scale that we have. And all the differentiability properties that are valid for this guy are also valid for the scaled guy. So in particular this is C1 on the space that we have just discovered here by the work of Simon Blatt. And um, the other comment, and this considers also lecture four, is that I want to extract some information out of the proof of yesterday's theorem two. So extract from Pavel's theorem two the following uh, quantified injectivity estimate. And let me say that as a lemma. So in my calculations, lemma four now. 
and um, it's the following let uh, e be some positive number and um, uh, take a sequence and for my application it's enough to say sequence in C1 and unit length interval values in R3 all these guys are arc length parameterized and um, all these guys are injective but uh, this injectivity could could vary rapidly between different eyes so uh, I want to incorporate this E saying that you have that the supremum over I in N of the energies and you could also later do the scale energy but these energies are actually the supremum is bounded this is the number E then one has the uniform injectivity estimate gamma I of uh, say S minus gamma I of T is greater or equal than so I should say there is a constant epsilon depending just on Q in this range between 2 and infinity and this constant E which is just the energy bound such that this difference can be bounded by the minimum of this epsilon and uh, I think Pavel wrote one half of S minus T and this holds true for all I this epsilon doesn't depend on I and if you recall the proof which I'm not going to repeat it was within the theorem 2 he used uh, as an essential step the diamond property so the geometric property came in to prove this uniform injectivity estimate and we are going to use that in lecture 4 to go to a limit to a curve which then automatically is also injective a statement that Pavel made yesterday already so this is so much I'm a little early but this is so much all I have to say for this lecture and I would like to invite you for lecture four on Friday morning, very early at nine o'clock. Thank you.